good evening to all of you i hope you're all uh, staying safe and keeping yourself fine a warm greetings from uh, chennai center for china studies and national maritime foundation uh, here we are today for a c3s nmf institutional dialogue on the topic indo pacific strategies perceptions and partnership to speak on this topic we have with us cleo pascal associate fellow asia pacific program chatham house london on this note i would like to request commodore rs fasan indian navy retired director c3s and regional director national maritime foundation tamil nadu to deliver the opening remarks over to you sir thank you bala uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen a great pleasure and honor to have dr cleo pascal with us and uh, you know it's i believe only 7:30 in the morning at miami so we are very happy that uh, she is woken up early and uh, is happy to be with us uh, you know we've had uh, uh, a lot of uh, interaction with many scholars scholars around the world and i myself was at chatham house a uh, few years before uh, leo joined uh, chatham and that was for a maritime security seminar where i shared the platform with uh, an american admiral serving admiral and we are looking at issues related to maritime security in the indian ocean region indo pacific uh, as a word had not gained that much of traction at that time you know in fact it's much later i'm i'm actually talking about 2012 when i was in uh, uh, chatham house and uh, you know uh, people were talking about uh, the indo pacific and even here in 2011 uh, when uh, ms hillary clinton came here she addressed a gathering here in a uh, large university in uh, chennai and where this term indo pacific was brought up so we come a long way from there you know and there have been ups and downs in the very concept and uh, therefore it, it will be a, a great opportunity for all of us to learn about uh, you know what indo pacific is in terms of uh, the seven countries that you have uh, engaged with because your your approach has been uh, uh, a little different uh, you are trying to look at the strategies uh, perceptions and partnership of these seven countries Uh, but it's again fluid, and it's not that it's going to be restricted to just the seven countries. People are already looking at the quad plus, and we are looking at the kind of challenge. And uh, you know, every day you will see something or the other that is in the newspaper. And before the formal meeting started today, we did discuss the response of Bangladesh, a, a sovereign country, which told China, "I said, you know, lay off." You know, and unfortunately, China seems to be miscalculating. its ability to influence governments big or small and even in australia you saw what happened you know where one of the serving diplomat walked into another rooms and uh, was trying to pass uh, scriptures so you know obviously uh, china under xi and with, with the ccp seems to look at the entire world as something where they can dictate and can get away but you know increasingly they are realizing particularly after covid that it is not going to be the case you know because there are great alliances both informal and formal and uh, which is where uh, your inputs are going to be vital in terms of what kind of partnership you are likely to evolve you know, not just as the main partners who are there who we all know about but in addition the others who are likely to join i think in one of your podcast which i listened to you know uh, you brought out the fact uh, in an interview with uh, a french uh, france uh, french specialist where they have a phenomenal interest in the indian ocean region you know with with the largest exclusive economic zone out there and and the kind of the territory that they still hold there are uh, interesting uh, uh, you know developments that are taking place we also heard recently that uh, you know uk has decided to send its carrier you know so the carrier is going to come there and so uh, and, and i just i think two days ago there was this report to say that uh, uh, the pla navy is trying to hone its skills in terms of carrier battle group formations so they had the red and blue operating in the LOC uh, where the, the carrier bone uh, aircraft were pitted against uh, missiles and uh, land bone aircraft so obviously they are trying to come of age in terms of their ability to be a blue water navy so this is what uh, portends a certain amount of i won't say danger but more of a challenge to the the free world which is what we also trying to talk about so you know all these uh, decades uh, china has perhaps followed the ancient wisdom of biding for time and building their strength very well but maybe they are in great hurry now you know from the developments which is there now whether it's in south china sea or east china sea or or the commissioning of the maritime militia you know uh, or or the provocative steps that are taken particularly in terms of uh, smaller countries uh, that the future is something which uh, requires uh, others particularly the free liberal democracies to come together 
you know, China in, in its communication to Bangladesh clearly said, you know, don't join this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, whatever association that you're talking about as fraud. And that, that's something that's aimed at China. So within the academic circles, at least we should have no doubts that it's indeed aimed against China. Why should we fight shy of saying this? Because, you know, China doesn't mince words when it comes to its expansionism. I mean, it, uh, when it, you look at the physical kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, occupation of uh, islands, rocks and reefs, and violating unclosed provisions, etc. So, you know, there were some terms which are used with you. I am sure you will expand on them. You know, one was the rule-based international order. So again, you know, within our discussions, we found that there are questions on this itself. Because on one hand, we know that China has violated the provisions of UNCLOS when uh, in 2016, uh, the, 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 the arbitration, arbitration went against them. And Philippines today has realized that uh, it really has not gained anything uh, when it fell into the trap of uh, China, which promised a lot of uh, investments. And now there are uh, everyday clashes in the fishing zones. So this is, this is the reality. On the other hand, when you have a major partner of uh, the Quad uh, who has not ratified the UNCLOS, you know, also therefore, uh, while it says the freedom of uh, uh, freedom, of free and open Indo-Pacific is necessary, freedom of navigation is a must, and we are going to carry out freedom of funds, uh, you know. So all this is something where they, it raises a lot of questions and what is the understanding of this grouping in terms of the rule-based international order? How are you going to implement it, if at all? And what more options are available? And therefore, the inputs that they're going to provide, uh, you know, in the next 20, 25 minutes, you're free to take a little more time if required, will be of uh, great uh, relevance to the happenings today uh, in the Indo-Pacific and also in the Indian Ocean region, uh, which is central to India's aspirations. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand over the floor to you and all the best. Thank you, Cleo. Thank you very much, Commodore. Thank you very much to uh, C3S and NMF. Um, and and many of the friends that I see on here who've taught me so much uh, over the years, I'm uh, a little bit nervous because the the amount of knowledge uh, on the on the screen is very daunting. So I'll I'll get through the through the presentation as quickly as I can, uh, so that you can uh, uh, ask some really good questions. Um, I'm going to be quickly summarizing this research that we did, and I'll give you uh, the context for the research. Basically, um, if we could get the first slide up. Uh, then I'll, I'll be able to uh, explain it to you as we go along. Um, okay, thank, thank you. So um, what, we, what we wanted to do was, uh, as the Commodore was saying, there's increasing interest in the area, and it is moving uh, uh, very, very quickly. Um, so we... <laughs> we wanted to get a sense of how each of these countries, these seven countries that we chose for reasons I can explain along the way, are looking at each other. So next slide, please. Yeah, so we realized that a lot of countries don't actually understand what the other countries think of the region and think of their relationships with them. And uh, understanding these convergent and divergent perceptions is very important for making partnerships more effective. Uh, so, for example, I think there's been uh, an underappreciation deliberately created on the part of Paris for the role that France plays in the region. So, um, uh, people in the UK, for example, might not fully understand the depth of the relationship between France and India, for example. So, just to get a sense within the seven of of where it's working and where it's not working. And in order to do that, we, we convened round tables around the region. Next slide, please. So we partnered with think tanks in each of the countries. In, uh, in the US, it was the East-West Center. Chatham House, we did at Chatham House. In France, it was with IFRI. In India, it was with Gateway House. Um, we wanted, because of the nature of the Indo-Pacific, we wanted it to um, obviously have a maritime focus. Chennai and NMF would have been uh, an amazing place to do it as well. Um, the, one of the advantages of doing it with Gateway House Mumbai was it could bring in the commercial element. And there is an anticipation that potentially India would play an increasing commercial role. This was before COVID that we did this uh, the field research. We, the last bit of the field research, I flew out of Japan in March 2020, just as the COVID uh, curtain was coming down over the 
world. So this is really kind of the research field research was really pre COVID, but we already knew then that, that India is, was not only an important player in the Indo-Pacific from a strategic and intellectual conceptual perspective, but also from a commercial perspective. So that was one of the reasons for going to Mumbai. Um, and uh, Mr. Devley, who's joined us, was uh, was very helpful on talking us through some of those issues, including things like a potential merchant fleet. Uh, in the Kingdom of Tonga, we did it with the Royal Oceania Institute. We went to Tonga because there's a lot of talk about the Pacific Islands, but not so much with the Pacific Islands. So we really wanted to hear what they had to say as representative of this vast oceanic region that is a, a central part of the Indo-Pacific. Um, in Japan, we did it uh, with the Indo-Pacific Studies Group. Um, all of these were also supplemented by face-to-face -face conversations. Uh, and in China, it the research was done by a Chinese colleague in China, in Mandarin, uh, with face-to-face -face interviews that made people more at ease in China about talking about some of these issues. Although you never know, as, you, as, as C3S knows, you never know how to validate the information you get out of China. It's very difficult. Um, there was also a standardized survey. And all in all, we talked to a couple of hundred Indo-Pacific policymakers and, and experts. And again, the field research was done up, up until March 2020. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the way that we did the roundtables was we, we asked at local, local experts. So really, the only people in the room were, apart from uh, myself or if anybody else was with me from, from the research team, it was just people from the country. So we would ask them how their relationships, bilateral relationships, were with the, with the five other countries. We didn't have to mention China because China was all over the place anyway. Uh, and how they, how they thought they might change out until 2024. We needed to pick some sort of a timeline. We picked 2024 because that would be the the end of the term of the next US president, so maintain some sort of consistency, and what would be positive, negative, or inflection points along the way, potentially. Next slide, please. So one of the major uh, findings from that stage of the field research, again, up to March 2020, was that across all of the countries, not including China, we saw three major themes. One was within the decision-making process in the countries, there was domestic division regarding China. Generally, the political and economic communities favored more engagement with China, and the defense strategic and intelligence communities were, to put it mildly, much more cautious. At the same time, there was a lot of foresight uncertainty given major factors such as elections or Brexit that w was making decision-making uh, complicated. One of the U.S. participants said that from a U.S. perspective, there were more balls in the air than there had been since uh, World War II. So the result of the domestic divisions combined with the uncertainty was an enormous amount of hedging. And in that kind of that hedging space uh, gave a lot of leverage to, to those who were much uh, more pro-China engagement. Next slide, please. So to give you an idea of the sort of kind of granular level field research perceptions, so remember we asked them each bilaterally. So this is a comparison of what the US was saying about France and what the France was saying about the US. So the US was saying, these are the, the, the people that we spoke with. Again, this is hardly a massive uh, cohort, but it, it seemed to be relatively indicative. Um, they said that they're, Desire, France's desire for a special relationship with the U.S. changes with every French president. As a result, the U.S. can't trust the French in the same consistent way that it trusts the U.K. and Australia. Uh, Washington can't bring Paris into closer intelligence sharing if it doesn't know if it can count on France after the next French election. So that was a, a, a restraint on the intelligence sharing component, not necessarily the military, but that was a problem that the, that the U.S. side saw on building deeper French relationships. On the French side, they they saw the U.S. as um, high risk of U.S.-linked strategic surprises. They uh, assessed that militarily China is closing the gap on the U.S. and the Indo-Pacific, which is something that, by the way, that the U.S. side saw also. And therefore, the France French response was to create stronger ties with Japan, India, Australia, Indonesia, and other partners within the region. 
So this gives you an idea of how the perceptions of each of those bilateral relationships affect strategic decision making. Next slide, please. Uh, another one that uh, I'll fo I'm, I'm focusing on more on countries that that you know India knows India very well, so I'm not going to tell India about <laughs> India. Uh, but these are some of these kind of less less uh, examined relationships. Uh, so the French UK one and the UK France one is is currently moving quite a lot because the UK has released its integrated review and has announced its Indo-Pacific tilt. But the question is how, how viable are they as partners? Um, where are their constraints? And there are actually quite a few constraints. Um, so from a French perspective, the UK has limited military presence in the Indo-Pacific and what it has are largely empty shells. Now remember this is uh, ending in March, 2020. So this is before the uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, carrier strike group deployment was announced. French defense industries have succeeded in acquiring important positions in former British zones of influence. This is what the French were, were saying to, to me, to, to our research team. The French and the British policies have not always been aligned. Post-Brexit, uh, there was a lot of French unease with the positioning of global Britain, uh, partially because it wasn't backed up by the budget, although that's changed a little bit now. And also it wasn't seen as good for France because it could evoke colonial memories. And the French have been uh, very careful over the last few decades to, to present itself as a local power in the Indo-Pacific and uh, to work on that positioning as opposed to the post-colonial uh, perception. Uh, they questioned whether the UK would take the plunge and pursue a comprehensive strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in terms of positive ways forward between France and the UK, they saw, uh, basically, they wanted access to the UK bases and potentially joint training exercises. In terms of the UK, the, the UK had a level of admiration for France's engagement in the Indo-Pacific, and they thought it was something that the UK should emulate. Uh, this, of course, made the French nervous because, again, they didn't want the UK to uh, trigger the colonial memories of France. Um, they wanted to work with France on capacity building in the Indo-Pacific, for example, training on the unconventional law of the sea, uh, which I, I'm not sure people in the area think they need, um, but also strategic threat analysis, which would have the added benefit of giving insight into whether the UK and France shared the same threat assessments. So again, you can see there's, a, there's quite a gap between the way the two countries see each other at that time in the context of operating in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I'd like to highlight the relationship between Japan and Oceania because uh, India has a very good relationship with Japan and, and wants to create a better relationship with Oceania. Um, uh, Prime Minister Modi has, has made it a priority. There's been difficulty in actioning it for a range of reasons. So it's good to understand uh, pot the potential for a trilateral relationship, perhaps, with Japan into Oceania. Japan has, um, has made Oceania a priority, particularly uh, Palau, PNG, Fiji, and Tonga. The last three of the countries with militaries in Oceania. It has embassies uh, across the Pacific. It is very well represented diplomatically in Oceania. The major driver is China, obviously. Uh, Japan knows from its own history how strategic the islands become in case of conflict. Um, and their goal to mitigate the China threat is to provide Oceania with financial infrastructure and development options to enable enough national independence to forestall independence, to forestall co-option by China. And they've been very good at it. They provided pieces of critical infrastructure into the Pacific that have um, forestalled uh, China getting a footprint in the same way. Uh, they want Oceania to feel that even if politics change in other capitals, Japan will still be there for them for them to help back them up. Um, and they want to deal with Oceania directly, but Australia and New Zealand um, have been resistant. Again, this is the perception from Tokyo of having Japan on the front line. So Japan includes them um, in joint development projects, even if it's not their area of expertise. Um, and there have been discussions uh, between Japan and India working together in Oceania, but at that time, Australia in the words of the Japanese, didn't want it. From an uh, Oceania perspective, there's quite a bit of Japanese influence, and I can, I can go into it in, in more detail if you want, but it's more than one would expect, and there are a lot of cultural affinities as well. Um, next slide, please. 
so I'm not again I'm not going to go into uh, the the kind of what India has to say um, but just to give a quick overview of, of the, the five bilaterals uh, they at that time March 2020 uh, the, the UK India relationship was not great uh, and the Indian participants mentioned a range of issues including things and I'm very glad to see Mr. Devley is here because this is one of the issues that he raised uh, he raised which is um, even on, on granular things like the, the UK insurance sector making it difficult for India to raise a merchant fleet um, that, that aren't being properly addressed. In terms of India-France, the relationship is very strong on both sides. The desire for the relationship is very strong on both sides, um, especially around the Indian Ocean, maritime domain awareness space more. Uh, in terms of India Tonga, the Tongan side, you have no idea how much the Tongan side wants to engage with India. They want uh, access to Indian education, uh, medical care, um, economic development structures, village-based economic structures, but it's very difficult to engage because of uh, there are no direct flights. To, to get a visa is complicated if you, if you need to go through Australia and New Zealand to get there. Prime Minister Modi made it so that uh, people from Oceania can get visas on arrival in India, which was extremely helpful, but, the, but even without the pandemic, the, just the contact is difficult. There's very little diplomatic representation. Uh, the India-Japan relationship, as you know, is strong on both sides, and at that time, the India-U.S. relationship was very strong uh, and growing in trust. But uh, on the Indian side, there was concern, which persists, uh, but a lack of consistency on the U.S. side. Next slide, please. The China relation, the China overview, um, is pro probably the most relevant uh, for C3S. So, what came out of the Chinese? Uh, research and, it, and again a lot of it was done through the standardized survey so we could have a baseline compared to the other countries. What they what the what the Chinese interviewees were saying was they thought the US Navy would be focused in the West Pacific due to geographic and logistical constraints and so far there was no sufficient military base support for the US Navy logistically as required in the Indo-Pacific region. They thought, all of them, thought that there was a likelihood of kinetic conflicts occurring in the Indo-Pacific by 2024. Uh, they disagreed about the scale of the conflicts, whether they would be skirmishes or something larger. Some said the real frontier of great power competition lay in the technology race, particularly with quantum computing and AI. And what happened in the Indo-Pacific region in terms of the development and use of AI was seen as a reflection of great power competition and was directly linked to the military domain. This is something the Commodore mentioned in the beginning. All of them, everybody we interviewed, suggested that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea by 2024 uh, would no longer reflect the reality of the current international maritime regime. Those with a strong military background believed that UNCLOSE would no longer be valid by 2024. And those who had more of a foreign policy background proposed modifications to UNCLOSE to make it fit for purpose uh, that would be from an obviously Chinese perspective. Uh, many saw Beijing as a major HADR player by 2024 and that China would extend its HADR to smaller states within the Indo-Pacific, uh, but doing so might raise eyebrows in the US and Australia because clearly it would have uh, military connotations as well. The interviewees said Beijing would play an even greater role in fighting terrorism and piracy in the region, partially due to China's increased economic activities but also partially due to the necessity of putting their growing massive Chinese Navy in action mode. So they have the ships and they have the intention of using them. So that's how the world stood based on our interviews in March, 2020. Next slide. And then came this. Next slide. And then came under COVID, this incredible expansion of aggression on the Chinese side, and they, they did not, China, Beijing did not see uh, COVID as an excuse to do anything but expand its uh, power while the rest of the world staggered. Um, and India knows this extremely well. Next slide, please. This is probably one of the, one of the, most difficult uh, and important events of the last year. It was the, the uh, 20 men killed in action um, in Galwan, uh, which I think 
uh, focused minds, not only in India, but around the world. And India's response to it, um, which included things like banning of the apps, was uh, very comprehensive and very well thought out and involved tools that uh, I think the rest of the world could learn from. We can discuss later if you want. And the outcome of that in part was, next slide, please. Things like uh, Australia coming back into Malabar and uh, much more um, uh, coming together globally. So the report continues from March 2020 to March 2021. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Anyway, I'll tell you, I'll just tell you because we're almost at the last slide. So what we found was that um, the trends focused and accelerated by COVID-19, the global economic downturn and Chinese aggression, including in taking over Hong Kong, resulted in a reduced domestic division across um, across most of our countries. So the, the voices that were supportive of China became much smaller and the voices that were cautious, to say the least, about China became much louder. As a result, also, uncertainty receded. Uh, there were the political transitions they went through, Brexit happened. Um, the worsening economic conditions actually made it easier to take a stronger stand on China. So you're not as concerned about rocking the economic boat if the economic boat is already sinking because of the pandemic. And as a result, around the world, in many capitals, hedging decreased and a stronger willingness to push back on China emerged. And what we saw was a greater drive for new and renewed partnerships beyond China's orbit. Uh, so the Quad really was really reinvigorated. Uh, various logistical agreements were signed. BECA was signed. The Japan, Australia, India Supply Chain Resilience Initiative started to come into place. And there's discussions about an Indo-Pacific Charter. Uh, so the, the strategic environment changed dramatically within a year, uh, be, you know, because people started to see what China really was. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this, after the report, a real litmus test for this to see whether the change is real or not, has been um, what this terrible crisis that, that India is going through at the moment, which might heart breaks for it's really it's it's really hard to to watch it happen um and 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 what we're seeing in terms of global response has been a real indicator of how well and how serious countries around the world are taking india and taking india seriously is a real litmus test for whether you understand china and understand the, what's happening in the pacific so of course russia rushed in very quickly with support as did france it took the us a few days uh, the first statements coming out of Ned Price out of the State Department were uh, atrocious, um, but within four or five days, uh, that situation changed dramatically. So now we'll get to see who, who really is going to be there uh, standing by India in difficult times and what that will mean for the Indo-Pacific. Um, and so that's, that's really it. That's my presentation and um, summary of the report. Uh, this is, if you want more, there's the report, there are the meeting summaries, there's the podcast, there's a panel of launch discussion. Um, I can put all the links in the chat box. Uh, but now I'm very much looking forward to, to listening to what you have to say. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, Cleo. What I will do right now is to allow Bala to, I know, steer the questions towards you. And uh, you know, we can decide on how to handle them. Or you can take them two or three of them together, or you can address them, uh, you know, ind ind independently, individually, uh, as at your convenience. Well, please uh, read out the questions, and uh, you know, you can uh, allow her to handle it in the manner that she decides is appropriate. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Cleo. Uh, the first question is by our director. He has asked. Uh, as we all witnessed in the case of Bangladesh, it is very clear that China will apply diplomatic, political, and economic pressure to dissuade potential partners for the Quad Plus. How do you see this evolving in the next three to five years in the post-COVID scenario? So this is this is why India is so important. Uh, 
China comes into a country, so th this is now this is we're shifting over to my analysis as opposed to what what came out of the report. Uh, China uh, comes into a country through uh, economic engagement. It has a strategic component to it, and but it's a braided approach. So it's economic, it's strategic, and that third braid is off often corruption and uh, and criminal activity, uh, very socially destructive. Um, so if you can offer countries an economic alternative, you can forestall those other two, the strategic and the um, uh, the, the corruption activity, which, which, which changes the entire decision-making process at the political level and makes it very difficult to retrench afterwards. And India is really the one of the very few countries that can offer economic engagement al alternatives to, to China. It has um, a low cost, good quality product. We see it with the vaccines, you know, in China is not the one that's trying to vaccinate the world. India is the one that's trying to vaccinate the world. We see it in Africa where uh, Indian goods are, are, are valued. We see much more of that desired in Oceania as well. The challenge is that, um, that economic engagement, because India is a democracy, it doesn't have the uh, market distortion that Chinese economic engagement has because it's not subsidized by the government and it's not uh, facilitated by a, a range of other diplomatic procedures. So things like the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, um, if it can be expanded, are a very viable way forward for giving countries an alternative to China. As we saw in Bangladesh, countries don't like to be bullied by China. They like to have as much strategic autonomy as possible, and the strategic economy autonomy comes out of economic autonomy. So, um, you know, in, in India's uh, ability to uh, trade and displace is very important. That means that the West has to get out of the way in a lot of places and let and let India trade on things like pharmaceuticals um, for for the for the good of uh, global prosperity, <laughs> stability, and security. Ironically, so the d discussion about the link between economics and and strategic uh, positioning is happening now in a way that wasn't happening uh, before COVID, which is very helpful, and hopefully um, it it will increase and uh, will be facilitated from within India as well. Uh, the world really, really needs more economic trade, especially the, the, the non-first world economies need more, more trade with India in, in a range of sectors. Uh, thank you. Uh, speaking of democracy, we have next question by Mr. Uh, Simran. He has asked about the spirit of Quad, uh, which involves uplifting the democratic values but he says India plays a very subtle and quiet diplomacy when it comes to uh, Myanmar's lack of proper democracy, uh, for which India has said that uh, Myanmar's democratic issue is its internal matter. Could we expect a change in India's quiet diplomacy towards Myanmar in the coming years? And what is the future of diplomatic tussle between China and India with regard to Myanmar? Uh, so I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on Myanmar, but um, uh, I, in the same way, I, I really hope there's no change to India's quiet diplomacy, because in the same way that uh, India fills, in the context of the Quad, a unique economic offering, it, it has a unique diplomatic offering in the region. Uh, first, first of all, it is of the region in the way that n no other country is. Uh, the links go back thousands of years, you know that from Chennai very, very well. Uh, so those cultural linkages, the, um, uh, the the trade linkages are very old and very deep, and and the the culture of engagement is very different. You know, India doesn't back other countries into a corner uh, and make grand statements. It gives maneuvering room to people to try to find a way out of it out of a difficult situation. So it is the the bridge country between uh, the the West and uh, that that sort of the the non Japan Asia type of the part of the Indo Pacific. So uh, it, it, that backdoor diplomacy is incredibly important um, and uh, and I, I and very valuable. They're valuable to all concerned. So I hope it, I really hope it doesn't change. Uh, thank you. There's a question on the post COVID development, which has shown that the Quad. Now it looks beyond security because this holds a lot of appeal for all members of the Quad 
and also allows them to create and develop alternate structures for supply chain vaccine diplomacy etc uh, what more can be done to make this more vibrant so all of these uh, all, all of these task groups that are forming are really important and uh, you know so we've got quad we have emerging technologies we have climate change um, it would be interesting to see uh, perhaps region specific engagement so that they can be more broad uh, one one thought would be for example a quad working group on Oceania engagement in Oceania because again each of the four countries brings completely different tools to the to the table um, this is what's useful for understanding what the quad can or should bring is understanding what China is trying to do because essentially the, the quad is trying to give an alternative to China and you need to understand what Beijing's approach is in order to understand what the alternative is. And so the, the, the thing to understand about Beijing is this, this core philosophy of comprehensive national power. So Beijing, this is in all the think tanks and it's a guiding doctrine of, of what Beijing is doing, which is Beijing is trying to create a situation where China is number one in the world in terms of comprehensive national power. A comprehensive national power from the it's it's an empirical metric. It's a the the, the Beijing gives it gives numerical values to different countries in terms of their ability in terms of their comprehensive national power. And so that and and what goes into calculating that metric is everything you would expect: military, foreign power, but also things you wouldn't expect: cultural power, um, access to natural resources, whether in your own country or somebody else's. You know, whether a country has a panda in their zoo, you know, that all goes into contributing to China's calculation of its own conference of national power. So that was why when uh, India banned the apps after Galwan, uh, it was an indication to, to a lot of us that India understands China in a way that many other countries don't. Because those apps were uh, gathering metadata that was being used to refine uh, China's weaponized AI. It was used to uh, gather intel. It was used for uh, underbidding uh, Chinese Indian companies that were competing with Chinese companies in Africa. Um, it knocked a few billion dollars off of the uh, parent companies. So it was. They were those. Those WeChat and TikTok were examples of China's comprehensive national power. And by India blocking them, it meant that India's strategists understood that. So in terms of what the Quad should do, the, it, it really looking at what China is doing and figuring out ways of uh, pushing back in the most damaging sectors to the independence of the countries that you're trying to engage with is, uh, is, is one of the ways forward. Thank you. Uh, speaking of Quad, there's a question by Mr. Anirudh. He has asked, a couple of days before China had threatened Australia, which is one of the Quad partners countries with ballistic missile. So the question is, if the Quad is going to react to the situation, uh, what would be the likely actions taken by the Quad? So this is this is the question: What is the Quad, right? Um, uh, I'm I don't know what it is yet, um, and I, I you know this is the kind of the military component of it, but. Australia, this is this again goes back to the economic component, and and I should say, actually, I should have said at the beginning that this research was funded by the Strategic Policy Unit of the Australian Department of Defense. We didn't include Australia as one of the countries um, because you know didn't want to have any sort of conflict of interest or anything. But they, the Australians, have been very concerned about this topic and understanding their operating environment for a long time. Um, and Australia's vulnerability is economic. It come it it's being hit by, by China very hard. And so things like India buying barley from Australia was very helpful. That is as much of a pushback on comprehensive national power as sending ships to the region. So figuring out uh, ways of keeping the uh, Australian economy uh, diversified is, uh, is strategically important. Uh, in terms of kind of military pushback, there is talk, again, this is something that has come out of India, an idea that has come out of India for this Indo-Pacific Charter, uh, which would be modeled a little bit on the Atlantic Charter of 1941, which, is, um, which was signed between the US and the UK to put forward a kind of eight, nine point plan of what the world should look like so that you have something to work towards. And that could be, Think, like things around space or uh, digital um, 
things. And in that context, if you do something like that, you can broaden out beyond the quad with countries that don't have military capacity, but can potentially be in a position to apply pressure. But you don't, what you don't want to do, obviously, is put in place red lines that can't be enforced. And we're in a, where the situation is developing very quickly, and the Quad may be the right venue for some of these pushbacks. Um, uh, economic structures may be others, and things like Indo-Pacific Charter may be others. Um, but, you know, the, the, the Australia situation is China doing that old thing of, you know, trying to kill the chicken to scare the monkeys. Um, and if, if the Quad uh, lets Australia suffer uh, severely, then we're all weaker because of it. Thank you. Uh, there's a question by Mr. Anil Devi. He has asked, uh, what if anything has been the impact of the happening of COVID-19 to the world on your research and thought? And do you feel that China has come out stronger at least as of now? So I think uh, I, the, the, the impact of COVID, the, the illness, uh, the response to COVID, which is separate, this is how different countries have locked down or not locked down. Um, and China's continued, in fact, increased aggression during this time of crisis have, have had enormous effect on uh, the way that strategic uh, communities around the world view China. Uh, they they came out as the commenter mentioned at the beginning. You know the the sort of speak you know speak softly and bide your time is over now. We know what China is, um, and and the the sort of things that you can discuss about China uh, now were not possible even a year ago. That those discussions would just be shut down. And I think it's probably going to get worse and worse as more information comes out about the origins of COVID and the way that. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party allowed it to spread. Um, whether, you know, wh whatever happened with the lab or not, it's very clear now, the research is coming out, that this, that China had an epidemic and then knowingly turned it into a pandemic, which is consistent with the psychology of comprehensive national power, which is that you know, there are two ways your country can do better. One is your country gets better. The other is the other countries get worse. So if you think you're going to get hit, it's to your advantage to hit everybody. And if that means people gasping for breath in Delhi, that, that's a win by Beijing's uh, standards. So they've, they, what's happened in the last year is many more people, and I'd say the population is ahead of the, the uh, politicians in many countries, now know what the Chinese Communist Party is. And that has changed the calculation uh, substantially. Um, what that's going to mean going forward, I'm not sure, because China still has a lot of money spread around influence operations globally. So we're in a position of flux at the moment, where the awareness is there, but the pushback is, is there as well. So the outcome is, is uncertain. Uh -huh. Interesting question by Kamado Vasan. He has asked, what role do you envisage for Taiwan, uh, which of course is today totally dependent on USA's lead role in dealing with China? Ta so Taiwan, uh, I have an enormous amount of respect for Taiwan, for the people of Taiwan and the leadership of Taiwan. Um, they, they, are, uh, they showed their value um, when they... Um, uh, when they were the first ones to alert the world to COVID-19, to, to what was happening to the human to human transmission. Um, you know, they're very good international players. Uh, I think that there's, there's a lot more willingness because of, again, because of Chinese engagement and because of the role it's played over the past year um, to openly engage with Taiwan. And that was one of the last things that was passed in the Trump administration uh, was this uh, getting rid of the self-restrictions on engaging with Taiwan. And so we're starting to see openings that we hadn't seen before. So recently, uh, one of the first travel bubbles in Asia uh, was is between Palau and Taiwan. Palau is a U.S. freely associated state. 
uh, and Palau during the pandemic in part in response to China offered the US to, uh, to put in place increased military installations within, within Palau. And uh, at the same time, this is, this is sort of just in March, this March, um, Taiwan and the US signed a Coast Guard agreement and there's a question of expanding that potentially also to Palau. So Taiwan is carefully, uh, judiciously, and with the support, it seems like the US and increasingly of Japan, who mentioned it uh, in, in Washington for the first time in a joint statement with the US, mentioned Taiwan, the Taiwan issue, coming to the fore. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's no longer the relationship that, that is being hidden, which is a very good thing. So hopefully, we'll start to see more acknowledgement of the role that Taiwan can play as a provider of uh, prosperity and stability in a free and open Indo-Pacific. There's a question that Mr. Douglas does. So he has asked, do you think that India should prioritize better ties with the US, given the shared mutual threat that's elevating their status from major defense partner to major non-NATO ally? granting India access to advanced defense technology and interest in sharing. So this is, this is a decision for India, obviously. I mean, I'm not in a position uh, to, to say that. And I should say I'm not American, in spite of what, <laughs> my kind of odd accent. I'm a Canadian, so I, I, I am uh, living happily under the U.S. umbrella, but, um, I, you know, I haven't, don't have the background that India has with the U.S. And, and India, you know, the U.S. has not always been super great <laughs> in dealing um, with India, and uh, that's acknowledged. But I would say that now that, uh, that I was very heartened by the change in response to uh, India's COVID crisis, because the question was whether the new U.S. administration would truly understand uh, the importance of trust building with India. And I think what happened within those four days uh, between Ned Price doing the, uh, making that terrible speech at the State Department and the Biden administration saying, we're gonna start sending field military hospitals from local, from nearby bases and plane loads full of equipment. And we will support, uh, you know, vaccine patent, um, limitation reductions, that sort of thing, was, was a, a moment with, within that, the administration that was very important because there were elements that had come in uh, that were, to be quite blunt, pro-China and pro-Pakistan, and they were, their hands were shown through that crisis. And the uh, direction of the administration towards a position that is, that is supportive of India uh, was made clear. So that was, those were very unpleasant few days uh, uh, geostrategically, but I think that the administration has come out of it uh, sh showing that it, it understands the gains that were accomplished in the last administration and it wants to build on them. The tricky thing that India needs to deal with is the Russia relationship. And this is, the, the question is basically an S-400 relation, uh, purchase question um, because and, and the and the India Russia relationship is basically a Russia China relationship so if you think that the sino Russian relationship is on the ascendancy then uh, you know this old relationship that you have had with the Soviet Union and has continued through the, into into Russia and you can't deny Russia was one of the first countries to say we're going to come and help India during the COVID crisis. Um, you know that that you have to figure out how much of that relationship uh, is going to be compromised by the Russia-China relationship. So uh, you know I, I'm obviously biased in this, but I also don't have uh, the background India has in this. Um, uh, you know the gear and the and the intel that hopefully the U.S. is sharing with India now will hopefully make it much more secure. Becca was very very helpful. Uh, I hope in, in dealing with the Himalayan situation. Um, I, I hope that the deployments, the U.S. deployments, will be helpful. 
Um, and uh, the decision that India strategic community has to make, and in fact, I'd be very interested to hear from you on it, is what direction you think the Russia-China relationship is going to be going in, uh, because that to a large degree determines how far you want to go with the U.S. in your relationship. There's a question by Mr. Ashwin. He has asked, can you give a brief idea of the role of Africa in a long-term perspective? Africa is incredibly important. And again, this is an area where, uh, in terms of great powers, India has one of the best relationships uh, and potential for growth in relationships of, of any of the country. I mean, none of the quad countries, obviously, but, but many other countries otherwise don't have that sort of relationship that uh, India has with Africa. Uh, it's where you're coming, up, coming directly up against China. Um, but again, the populations don't like dealing with China. So there is a, an opening if the economic component of it can be, can be got right. And, and this is, there may be funding through the U.S., through things like the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, which is essentially Indo-Pacific, to or the Blue Dot Network, to try to create uh, alternative models to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but, you know, in India is, uh, Africa has the potential, it has a dynamic population, has a young population, it's uh, focused and hardworking and given a chance. It can, it can really bloom. Uh, I'm not sure we'd get that chance if China's going to be the one helping determine its economic growth. But if India does, I, I think it, it, it has an enormous amount of potential, especially from an Indian perspective in the coastal areas. But again, there, there are people here, I can see the names, who know much more about this. So I'd be, I, I don't know whether it's possible to have a discussion, other people to put in, put in their comments as thoughts and correct me and tell me where I'm wrong and what I need to know better as well. Uh, I'd like to learn from you very much if possible. Mr. Thomas has uh, brought a question on the UN clause. Uh, as you pointed out in 2024, the UN clause will become obsolete. So uh, is there any justification on the Chinese claims in the uh, South China Sea and uh, East China Sea? Your comments on that, please, he has asked. Yeah, so, uh, so it's the Chinese who think UNCLOS is going to be uh, obsolete. And they, and they can say it's going to be obsolete because it's not being enforced. So the uh, finding that was found in favor of the Philippines hasn't been, hasn't been enforced. So if you have an international treaty with, with no enforcement mechanism, then it falls under, in, in Ch China's doctrine of the three warfares, um, which legitimizes the way it engages, includes psychological warfare, media warfare, and also legal warfare, lawfare, and which also is a part of its unrestricted warfare doctrine, which is that it will take the pieces of law that are useful to it, and it will ignore the others. Um, so it's not surprising that uh, China will ignore uh, UNCLOS. Um, similarly, this is a decision on our side. If you know, if the rest of the world, the, the rational, reasonable world, if we want UNCLOS to continue, uh, then we need we need to enforce it. And in that case, uh, we need to back up countries like the Philippines that are fighting for their uh, acknowledged territorial rights. Uh, you know, the, and and we've been we tend to rely on the U.S. for this. Uh, at, you know, Scarborough Shoal was brokered by the U.S. and it was broken by the U.S. Uh, because during that administration there wasn't uh, an acknowledgement of the criticality of the issue. Uh, some of the same people from that administration are back again in this administration. Hopefully their approach will be different. But it's not just the U.S. that can enforce uh, or help back up the Philippines and the South China Sea. There, you know, it could be India, it could be Vietnam, it could be, uh, I mean, if you really want to push the envelope, it could be Taiwan if they're willing to do it. I mean, that's really kind of getting dangerous, but we can't accept a world where uh, the Chinese Communist Party determines what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable. The, the Economist, which has had terrible coverage of India for a very long time, recently did a cover where it put a, a map of Taiwan and called it the most dangerous place on earth. 
it's that's a complete misunderstanding mischaracterization it's china that's the most dangerous place on earth because it's china that would attack taiwan so again you know in the context of unclos the the problem is very clear the problem isn't unclos the problem is china and if we accept china's reimagining of the world if we accept its maps you know the one china policy includes chunks of india then we've lost and again this is an area where india has been extremely good about the messaging around this you know india has not accepted it and and is calling and is talking about on news shows the indo tibetan border you know the reappropriation of the narrative is just as important the first step towards getting to these enforcement mechanisms around the south china sea which in fact you could call I, again i heard one of the indian uh, news shows calling it the asean sea why are we using the chinese wording for it so uh, i would look to to india for leadership on the reframing uh, uh, the conceptualization of the indo pacific and getting away from this chinese narrative which legitimately some degree legitimizes its actions. Uh, there's a question by Mr. Uh, Amshuman. He has asked, as you can see, given the fact that Chinese has been trying to interfere with many of the domestic affairs and international affairs of other states, he has asked a question, uh, how would it be uh, feasible to take up the case of Tibet and Taiwan uh, so as to shore up a defense against uh, China? So the Tibet, uh, Tibet and Taiwan situation are a, li are a little bit different, uh, but I think that the Tibet, the Tibet situation has, it has really been underplayed. Uh, you know, there's countries, you know, we, they're very countries are very quick to talk about the Uyghurs, uh, as if sort of these human rights abuses have just started, um, and it's almost as if Tibet has been forgotten. Um, Kind of almost except when you when you read in the West, you know, t Tibet is often just added on, um, and and, uh, and that's a uh, it's a tragedy and it's an injustice. And again, I think it's uh, an area where India can lead in reframing the discussion uh, around this long history, 60, 70 year history of China claiming things that don't belong to it and doing terrible things to its inhabitants. Um, Taiwan is, uh, Taiwan has m more leverage points. I mean, even including in things like, uh, like chip productions, you know, like they, they, they're, it's a, it's a completely different sort of thing. Uh, but in both cases, normalizing the visibility of, t of Taiwanese or Tibetans at events, uh, interviewing them on TV. Um, bringing them into the conversation, giving them space in the international discussion, that would be a commonality. That would be very helpful. Um, it, it happens more in India than it does uh, in other countries, but it was something that, something that I would hope, for example, Japan would start to pick up on. I would hope Australia would start to pick up on, it, and obviously I would hope the U.S. would pick up on it as well in terms of the quad. Just letting people see there are Tibetans, <laughs> there are Taiwanese, and they uh, and they exist, and they have been victims of the Chinese Communist Party, and they need support is important. Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, there are two questions basically. I'll just put it one by one. You can just take it up. How do you relate the Indo-Pacific Charter with the Atlantic Charter of 1941? As a continuation to which, why was Tonga chosen in the study of seven countries? Why not other strategically located island countries in the Polynesian Triangle like Samoa, Tuvalu, and Cook Islands, etc., were uh, not chosen, I suppose? Okay, I'll pick. Uh, I'll do time your question first. So uh, we there are only three countries in Oceania with independent militaries. Uh, so that was the kind of the first uh, parameter because if you have a military, then you can engage. Uh, with other countries in ways that you can't if you don't have a military. Uh, and in fact, the Tong Tongans have been deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan and are, are much more integrated into uh, the, the international community in that way than one would expect. The other two countries with militaries are Papua New Guinea and Fiji. Uh, Papua New Guinea is, 
is, is much more complex for a range of reasons. Uh, what we wanted was a country that, that has similar concerns as 15 to 20 other small countries in the region. Fiji we didn't pick because Fiji is, is far down the road of Chinese co-option, much more so than a lot of the other countries. So we, and, and partially, in fact, as a result of mismanagement of the coup by Australia and New Zealand, in many cases, countries get pushed towards China because the West has mismanaged their relationship with that country. And China comes in as, in fact, as we, as potentially we could see in Myanmar as well. Uh, so we didn't want to get into that dynamic. We wanted to look at countries that are small, often overlooked, where the jostling is happening. They're kind of they're about they're trying to still trying to balance their relationships between China and, and other options. Tonga also uh, has never been colonized and has a monarchy, and that monarchy has uh, relationships with many other countries around the world. So, uh, for example, when the current Tongan king uh, uh, had his coronation in 2015, the, the current emperor and empress of Japan came to Tonga for that coronation. So they have, a, and they have relations with the royal family in Thailand, in the UK, and a range of other countries. So they have a, a foreign policy reach that is uh, quite, quite deep, and it's also quite old. Uh, because it is a, a monarchy, the foreign policy, and it has never been colonized, that the foreign policy establishment has been uh, negotiating treaties since the 1870s. It signed, it signed treaties in the 19th century with uh, the U.S. and France, and, and the current king is a direct descendant from the, from the king that signed those initial treaties. So within that foreign policy community, they have a substantial amount of foreign policy experience. And because they're the only Polynesian kingdom, they have soft power relationships with many of the other countries in Oceania, the, the, the princely houses of Samoa and, and French Polynesia, where they all have linkages back. So it is actually quite an important country uh, in, in terms of uh, leading um, uh, within the region. Uh, so that was why we, why we picked. Tonga. In terms of the Indo-Pacific Charter and the Atlantic Charter, uh, I think that what what the idea is, and again, I'm, this is an idea that came out of India for the Indo-Pacific Charter, so I, there may be people on this call who know it better than I do, uh, but the way that I've conceptualized, or see, see the conceptualization, is not, the Atlantic Charter was signed in 1941 at the, before the U.S. entered World War II. So we were in a kind of similar situation, much worse situation, but similar where the world was potentially on the edge of conflict. And the idea was to put together a document to say, what are we fighting for? If we have to fight, what kind of a world do we want to build afterwards? And so it included sections like, the people have a right to determine their own form of government, which was very relevant for India at the time. Uh, that was an, an put in at the insistence of the, of the US. Um, and it formed the basis of the creation of the UN and other organizations like that. Similarly, if the Quad is how we fight, uh, then the Indo-Pacific Charter would be why we fight. What are we, what kind of a world do we want to exist, if you know, if we're if we're coming up against China and whatever allies it has, and you can be sure it's going to activate all of its iron brother friendships, you know, and it's and it's going to be horrible. What are we fighting for? What kind of a world do do we want as a community, as a, as a free community, to be fighting for? So that's where the parallel would be. Uh, it would make sure that. The end goal is justifies whatever cost there is along the way. There's a general perception that the U.S. is more concerned on on its strategic economic relations than the overall state of affairs in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere. Is there any change after Joe Biden coming to power in the White House? So we don't we don't know yet. Um, that's why the you know it's we're at the we're at the 
it's like a new relationship, right? Where, you know, every, you, you look for every little sign and then ex try to extrapolate from that. So, you know, does, uh, you know, does she take her shoes off before she enters the house or not? I mean, if she doesn't, then there's something seriously wrong with every single aspect of her. So we're looking at every little uh, sign. Oh, you know, Alaska, what happened in, at, the, at the Chinese summit in Anchorage was not encouraging the way that uh, Washington finally reacted to the crisis in India was encouraging. So we don't quite know what direction is. However, and I'm sitting here in the United States, what I would not uh, underestimate is, you know, there, there are some very severe internal social divisions in the U.S. that are undoubtedly being exacerbated by uh, outside forces by Chinese uh, information warfare, Russian information warfare, uh, the ability of narrative appropriation and distortion by China, uh, especially through social media and especially because everybody's sitting at home and doing everything on their computers has increased exponentially. The ability, you know, the, the, um, problems that are happening on the ground here are undoubtedly being exacerbated by external factors. Um, and again, as mentioned, all of those existing pressure groups, uh, you know, the Pakistan lobby hasn't gone away, the China lobby hasn't gone away, they've maybe cloaked themselves in other clothing, but they're still here and they're still active. And an acknowledged goal is to create enough internal division within the US so that it's paralyzed internationally. So there's the strategic goals, the external strategic goals, but the U.S. is going through a crisis now uh, internally. So that's going to be, uh, that, that's also going to be an issue that needs to be tracked and kept an eye on. Uh, this is a question by uh, Lieutenant General Pia Shankar. He has asked, what role will U.K. and France play in the Quad? So this is this is obviously uh, going to be a decision. I think actually, fundamentally for India, uh, about how much you want external, or I mean, France would try to make a case that it's a local actor, and France is uh, probably much further ahead on the UK in terms of its engagement with all of the other countries involved, uh, except for the US. But in terms of the the, the you know the India relationship or whatnot is quite far ahead. Um, the UK would like to be more involved, as we see with the Queen Elizabeth Carrier Strike Group going through. They, you know, they have U.S. Marine F-35s embarked on their strike group. Um, they're heavily engaged with the U.S. Uh, and they and their capacities are have been degraded over the years, although they're trying to build them up. So it depends, kind of, on what the what the quad becomes. Um, and at the same time, if it is about the Indo-Pacific, then it, you know, there are very strong cases to be made that you would want to look at including Indonesia or Vietnam or you know, countries within the, within the region, strategically located countries with military capacity and intelligence us, you know, help uh, in the region uh, before looking to a country like the, like the UK, for example, or even France. So what you may end up have happening, and, and, and you, don't, you also don't want to, I would expect, dilute um, this, this quad. The quad is already complicated because of the, the various priorities of the different countries. Um, and before you start adding countries, I, ex I would expect you would want it to coalesce quite strongly so that when countries are, are added in, the, the note of it is already formed. Uh, the direction is already formed. So uh, I, I would expect, ideally, you would want, for example, a joint headquarters before you, you start adding in other voices. But I don't know. I can tell you that uh, you know, the, the French would certainly uh, want to engage. And if they're not allowed, if it's not allowed to engage, then it might actually see it as a threat to its own interests. Uh, because you know, France has very strong bilateral relationships, again, for example, with India, and it would see a growing India-U.S. relationship potentially as a threat to its own position in the context of its relationship with India and around things like defense procurement. 
So the balance between including somebody and to what degree you're including them might also be reflected not only to what they can bring to the alliance, but would they, if I don't, I'm using the word very loosely, but also would they be a problem if they're not included to a certain degree uh, in trying to create division within the uh, grouping? Thank you, Cleo. Taking a cue from what General has asked, if I may add, among the four countries in the Quad, India is the only country that has a, a border with China as well as has a boundary dispute with China. In case if the tension rises and escalates, how do you think Quad coming to the uh, rescue, ensuring up its defense against China? Your views, please, on this. So that this is this depends on on what India wants, uh, because we've I've actually had discussions with people in India about this. Uh, and I've, and and some some people in the U.S. like uh, Captain Snell, who is former head of uh, intelligence for the U.S. Pacific Fleet, has in writing, you know, said that he thinks that you know, the U.S. should offer uh, to send ground forces to help India on the border. And the response on the Indian side was from some of the people I'd be interested to know what you, what you, you guys think was, we don't actually want your troops. <laughs> you know, we, we'd like your, uh, your intelligence and we'd like your, your logistical support and, you know, maybe some boats and some planes, but we don't want your, your guys. Our, our fighters are the best at dealing with this, as the Chinese now know, and, uh, and you may not be the support you think you are. So uh, this is, again, something that, that you know, the sort of support that, that India wants uh, from Quad partners on the land border issue specifically, I, I think should, should be made clear from India. And I think in some areas, quietly, it is being made clear. And in terms of the land border, I'm not, I'm not sure what the Australians have to offer. I'm not sure what the Japanese have to offer, unless maybe kind of on the intel side. Uh, but on the U.S. side, if you need something more than satellites and logistics and very specific things, just write a newspaper article about it, and I can guarantee you somebody in the U.S. will pick it up and, and see what can be done. There is a desire to, to support India within the strategic and military community uh, that is very high. Uh, and, and, it, and a lot of it is very personal. Um, I, I've, you know, the the U.S. Uh, military people that I've spoken to about Galwan were extremely affected uh, by the by the way the Indian um, soldiers were killed uh, in action and um, and the way that attack happened. Uh, it's it's just not uh, acceptable. And as uh, military people, they understand what it what it means. And so at a very personal level, I think a connection was made um, that's uh, pro provoking a desire to, to be there if, if India requests uh, assistance. Thank you. In the best interest of time, I'm taking a question that will fill in the gaps in your presentation. Uh, Colonel Hariran has asked, how do you expect Quad Plus to shape up in Southeast Asia? Uh, quad plus two and what in which two? Southeast Asia. In the Southeast Asian region, how do you expect the quad plus two uh, shape up in the Southeast Asian region? Uh, but which would be the two? What two are we adding to the quad? Uh, that he has not mentioned. So I think we can go to the next question by Komodo Venukopal. He has asked the actual theater of uh, issues now that is happening, the real action that we see is in the South China Sea. So uh, ideally speaking, the main stakeholders for any, uh, uh, you know, like alliance to shore up our defenses against China should be including the ASEAN countries. But we find there is no mention of their inclusion in the Quad or uh, Quad Plus. Your comments on that, he has asked. Yeah. So again, um, the, the the Quad is a, is a little bit delicate at the moment, and there are uh, a lot of external forces. Uh, trying to break it up. I was part of a debate, an online debate, uh, two weeks ago. Um, and the proposition for the debate was China is right to be worried about the Quad. And uh, I was on the fore side. Yes, China should be worried about the Quad. And I was with somebody else. And there were two people that were arguing against us. It'll be available online soon. And one of the people arguing against us 
was um, a Portuguese politician who threw up all sorts of arguments like the quad will never work because the U.S. is the uh, only country, U.S. gives orders in every uh, association it's part of and the Indians will never follow orders from the U.S. So there were, there were a lot of things in there that, I mean, obviously India is not going to follow orders from the U.S., and obviously that's not the, what the Quad is, but that is the sort of narrative distortion that is being used to create divisions within the Quad, because as an Indian, you would hear that and you would say, yeah, I don't want to be part of an organization where the Americans are bossing us around. Um, so that puts a doubt in your head about what the Quad is, and it makes it more difficult uh, to, to promote it as, uh, as something that is good for India, if you think it's good for India. Uh, and that is, and, and I have to say, we lost the debate. You know, the, those arguments uh, ag against the Quad being viable uh, through this manipulation of the narrative were very effective. And the, the audience voted against us on it. So before we start kind of adding other countries to it, um, I, I would highly recommend that the trust be built between the four core members to the degree where you can withstand that sort of debate, where, where the quad members themselves can do better than I did uh, in a debate in, de in defending what the quad is. That doesn't mean that for specific operations, you can't add quad plus. There was just a quad plus exercise with the Canadians doing anti-submarine uh, exercises off of Guam. So you want to be able to plug in uh, different countries for things that are specifically important to them. But uh, building up that the quad core is very important. It's a very delicate, I'd say, year, year and a half now, you know, where the, the understanding that the anger at China is still enough there so that the populations and democracies are keeping their political and economic sectors on track. But I'm not sure how long that's going to last. So using that window to consolidate that grouping is going to be, I think, very important. Thank you very much. The last question for this session will be by Director General National Maritime Foundation. He has asked, thanks a lot for the informative presentation. Uh, do you see Russia-India relations vis-a-vis US-India relations as a binary one? That is, is it an either or situation? Uh, no. Uh, it's not, and it can't be because of uh, how much equipment you have, uh, but also in terms of other sorts of relationships you, you have with Russia, and, and, and Russia is a regional player in a way that the U.S. isn't. So, I mean, you know that from Afghanistan, for example, um, and Central Asia, I mean, you, you, you deal with Russia all the time. It's particularly, it, it does become binary in one sector, and that is uh, high-tech defense equipment because that that the s-400 purchase precludes cooperation with the u.s in other sectors and it ties you in to um, a sort of defense cooperation with russia that go that is generational because of the way that system works uh, and again that to me that's that's more of a question of the india China relationship, because if part of that system was co-developed with China, and China has that system, and China is working with Russia on advances on the system, and the country you're most likely to actually have to use it against other than Pakistan would be China, and I don't know how, how viable it is. And I've been assured by uh, at least one Indian uh, expert that India has the capability to make sure there isn't a kill switch in there or something like that. But this this the complexity of these systems is uh, very, very high. So if you're looking at something like the S-400, the, the bottom line question is, do you trust Russia with your lives? Because if, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, and that question, it plays into the Russia-China relationship. How, how heavily do you think Russia has been compromised? And for that, I personally, I look at things like where, where are the Russian oligarchs hiding their money? You know, is it, has it shifted from Switzerland to Macau? If their money is sitting in Macau, then, you know, they may not be making decisions that are going to wipe out their nest egg, that sort of thing. But um, it's not binary in the way it was during the Cold War, 
but it is binary in the in the context of the very high tech defense equipment. Thank you, Kilio, for taking all the questions. We have come to the end of the Q and A session. I would like to hand it over to uh, Commodore Vasan for further proceedings. Uh, thank you, Bala. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cleo. I think it's been an outstanding presentation, and you've taken on all the questions, you know, with such grace and uh, patience. So, and I uh, know I think it's a great degree of clarity which is there. Before I, uh, you know, uh, deliver the concluding remarks, uh, since it's, uh, Director General and MF is here, uh, may I request him to say a few words? I'm also very happy to see a large number of uh, researchers from uh, my organization, NMF, who are here, headed by the DG himself. So, you know, it's, I think it's an opportune time for me to invite him to say a few words on the occasion. Thank you. What do you Thank you very you much, uh, sir. And uh, Ms. Pascal, I'm a longtime fan of yours. So uh, anything that I say is going to be full of, uh, you know, uh, wonderful words and et cetera. But this piece I will mean from uh, quite sincerely. That having been said, I do want to make a couple of uh, points that I hope won't put too many cats amongst too many pigeons. Uh, but I want to emphasize, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you and echo the views of our um, uh, regional director in Chennai. Uh, first of all, I hope that the next time we do a decent study and all your studies are definitely that and more, you will have the NMF as a partner because if you're gonna talk about maritime issues and you're going to restrict yourself to commerce, then I think that we have some things to talk about after this. Uh, that having uh, also been said, let me talk to you about uh, three or four quick things. One is, um, you know, the way that I see that we will be able to handle China's, uh, first of all, China's arrival into the Indian Ocean is a given. Uh, not because it's strategic, but because its strategy is driven by its geoeconomic imperatives. And the failure of China to actually develop a domestically driven economy will mean that it will be continuing to move externally. And that means that primary goods will be moved from uh, or through the Indian Ocean. And that's where it will be. Now, the only way that I think that India can actually uh, deal with this is by itself knitting the region together in such a manner that China doesn't receive any scope, any, any fissure through which to enter this particular strategic gameplay. And in that, the West has a huge role to play, which it is playing very, very badly. And that is because India is being forced to compete with the West at the same time as it is trying to compete with China. And if we're going to end up in a competitive relationship with, let's say, the USA in Sri Lanka, or the USA in Africa, thanks to the Africa, AFRICOM desiring its own centrality, then we're, we're just dumb. The only way that we can really do this is if we stitch together a region and allow uh, some degree of trust to develop that India's, uh, um, as you rightly said, that, you know, India... The West needs to get out of the way in a couple of places, definitely. That's, uh, that's point number one. And it, we may not be good at everything, but we're the world's champion sulkers. So, uh, you know, if we end up competing with the USA and we lose, we will sulk. And we sulk like you've never... Okay. So, <laughs> uh, that's only on a, on a lighter note. But um, uh, the second point is this whole business. If we're going to knit the region together, we need connectivity and we need connectivity models that India already has and that the US, uh, for example, seldom seems to actually comprehend. Take the international north south transport corridor. It is from Azerbaijan uh, that it will move east west. Nobody's interested in moving things to St. Petersburg or vice versa. Everybody is interested in reaching Azerbaijan and then moving east west. So when we move east-west and we go east, of course, we go to Central Asia and we go west, we go to Central Europe, and then we will collide with the belts. And then we will have to take a view. And depending on how we have shored ourselves up, depending on what quality of infrastructure we are able to develop, and therefore, de depending on how good new initiatives such as the blue, net, the blue dot network are, and the blue dot network is one of those things which, you know, the last administrative uh, administration in, in Washington, D.C. said, and then they took their ball and went home. And so there's a large amount of confusion as to what is this? OK, so I think that 
connectivity is really quite critical and india has as you correctly said many connectivity models that are alternatives but are not and should not be presented as alternatives they should just be presented as connectivity models and then countries should be left to choose whether they want to follow a model that will saddle them in debt for life or not the next point is with russia so russia's situation is not quite as uh, you know uh, binary uh, or even as contemporary as is being made out uh, the sanctions on russia uh, have pushed Russia into uh, becoming a junior partner of China. And the only advantage there is that Russians are deeply resentful of this particular relationship. That, how is that to be leveraged, uh, is something that we all need to think about, whether sanctions are in fact the right way to continue to go, whether the sanctions based on Iran were sensible, uh, because they left India with, you know, a very bad situation at hand. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis our um, our oil, so I think that uh, Russia and the S four hundred, which you made uh, considerable mention of. Look, the thing is that the S four hundred hasn't got an equivalent in the United States arsenal because the structures are different. I mean, Canada is highly unlikely to go to conflict with the USA, uh, at least not while you're there. So, uh, so uh, th there is a problem. And uh, we need to be able to understand the ramifications of this problem beyond the binary issue. Uh, you said that France and uh, USA have a perceptual difference that every time there is a change of administration in France, the United States feels that uh, you know um, France's relationship with it uh, vacillates. I rather think that it's quite, it's quite similar with the US administrations and their changes. So I, I, I rather think that we need to be careful about uh, what degree of um, uh, you know, sa sa what sanctimonious degree we adopt in this regard. And the last point that I wanted to make was with regard to lawfare and, and perception management. And I could not agree with you more. I just want to say that there is a brownie point game of seduction going on in lawfare in, uh, in the Asia Pacific, in the Indo Pacific, in the South China Sea. And the United States of America is losing. And it is losing because it thinks that these things don't count and that the Chinese are simply making brownie points. But those brownie points are what are changing perceptions, just as you said was the case with the Quad debate. Uh, it is the narrative, it is the terminology, it is the language that relates to all this. And China is running hoops around us in this regard. So while the entire strategic community seems to be conscious of it we don't seem to be particularly successful outside of debate or inside of debate in actually convincing the larger the larger communities of industry and uh, politics i'll i'll stop there with a reiteration of how much i've enjoyed your uh, your book your report your writings and now listening to you so many 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 thanks thank you so much uh, commander vasan i'll turn it over to you again and next time, NMF. Uh, thank you, Admiral Chauhan. Even this time, it is NMF and C3S. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, I know. I, I, uh, there are a lot of things that I, I wanted to say, which obviously the Director General has already uh, made a reference to. So, therefore, I will uh, keep my concluding remarks very, very brief. I know uh, there are a lot of points which have already been covered. And the most important point for me is that, uh, you know, Australia and India, who are both reluctant partners, have actually been pushed by China to be part of the Quad. You know, that, that's an important that we must uh, remember. And obviously, China is facilitating this process of better uh, connectivity amongst these Quad partners. And I'm sure with the kind of pushing that they're trying to do in the region with Bangladesh, with others, uh, more of them will say now, you know, OK, you want to defy, we will defy you, and you will become the Quad Plus partners. And that's an important point that must be made. Also, uh, the, the point about uh, pooling of resources is an important one. <clears throat> While everybody tried to look at Quad as a security architecture, you know, the post-COVID has shown that it has the resilience to move beyond, you know, traditional security architectures. You also, of course, have recommended about uh, an Atlantic Charter similar to that, uh, which can be drawn up. Notwithstanding that, the fact that they're looking at uh, moving away from the dependence on China, the supply chain dependence, which is there, the vaccine diplomacy, which is there, where India is in the center of uh, producing vaccines funded by Australia, all these show that you know the Quad has phenomenal potential. 
you know we have phenomenal uh, amount of uh, uh, discussions within the cps and there are people for and against the court which is very good for our debate in the think tank you know and all, all that i always maintain is do not try to look at what the quad is not but try and see what it can become because that is where uh, there is a real challenge of identifying what we can become another point about uh, you know what should we do should we allow boots on the ground if there is a trans himalayan aggression i think india has been quite clear to say that yes there is support that will come our way in terms of intelligence in terms of hardware in terms of wet leasing which is taking place now all this will be there where we have still still certain amount of deficiencies so we are quite clear that we are not going to have you fight alongside us you know the time is not ripe for that but definitely we will seek that kind of support that is essential for us uh, to keep our momentum going and uh, as we have demonstrated this time you know and we could not have done it on our own and i must say that we are thankful to all the countries which have supported us in this initiative to take on a big bully uh, you know who did not expect this kind of uh, 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 you know uh, resistance from our india on the point of uh, the north south uh, uh, corridor which also dg brought out the point is very simple now we did uh, launch the so called asia africa growth corridor not much has happened there mainly because we do not have the kind of money that china has so china is able to begin to this 3.4 trillion dollars and take this to you know uh, to different places which are uh, in need of uh, foreign direct investment so my uh, recommendation here and appeal is that the quad partner should also have a separate pool of money which can contribute to this kind of alternate uh, avenues which are open to developing countries now if you do not give them any option uh, to you know begin to something else which is more uh, uh, benign uh, they will go to china because they need to develop they need to invest they need to uh, you know increase in, improve the lot of their people so this is where i think the quad has a potential to pull in some money and keep it aside and say here it is it's available for you you know it's not just the bri fund that's available it is not just the bricks fund that's available there's another fund which is available to you why don't you make use of this so i think this is where uh, there are a lot of potentials out there so with that i would like to come to the title of the presentation itself you know which was about uh, strategies perceptions and partnerships uh, my only point was that maybe the sequence will have to change a little everything starts with perceptions and in a matching of those perceptions with realities on the ground and then an analysis of what kind of partnerships are required to develop those cogent strategies so you know this is perhaps the sequence that will evolve over the period of uh, in the next 3 to 5 years post covid a lot of this is already there in the making and it's for all of us to sit together and continue in having this kind of discussions which brings about greater clarity in what can forums like what become and what it cannot become we are more interested in what it can become like i said earlier so therefore we need to look at those possibilities not keep on worrying about uh, you know what it cannot become you know we cannot be naysayers all the time so we need to make it happen and that's for india australia japan and you have to sit together and ensure that it happens so with that i must uh, formally thank you for this wonderful presentation you know like uh, the director general brought out i have also been uh, listening to your podcast i've been reading your articles i've been reading your papers and there's a phenomenal amount of uh, i input that we've been getting in cps because of your uh, uh, scholarly uh, work that's been done and we look forward to keeping in touch with you both through cps as well as through the national meta foundation uh, with that uh, may i hand over to bala for the formal uh, Lot of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, and thanks to NMF and all the people who are here uh, who joined in large number uh, to make this such a useful uh, discussion. Thank you, Jai Hind. What do you want? Thank you, sir. We take this opportunity to thank Director General uh, NMF and uh, Director Sitrius for their insightful remarks. Before I hand it over to my uh, colleague Nisha, uh, two interesting uh, events are coming up on 20th and 21st. Uh, both are by China Center for China Studies and National Maritime Foundation. Uh, one is a book discussion on Ambassador Vijay Gokhale, the Tiananmen Square, the making of a protest, which is happening on 21st. And 20th, we have a discussion as rightly brought out by uh, DJ NMF. Uh, this is a discussion moderated by Ambassador Yam Ganapati on uh, Russia-China relations and India factor into it, uh, which is happening on 20th and 21st. We would like to uh, see you all join for this. Uh, on this note, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Ms. Nishita, for the formal vote of thanks. Over to you, Nishita. Thank you, sir. Before we conclude today's program, I would like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to all who have helped make this a successful event. No C3S NMF institutional dialogue 
would be complete without an experienced and resourceful speaker. Today, we were privileged to hear from Dr. Cleo Pascal, Associate Fellow, Asia Pacific Program, Chatham House. Thank you, Dr. Pascal, for taking time to be with us today and for sharing your work from your vast experience, even as a journalist, on the subject of the Indo-Pacific. We have certainly benefited from it. On behalf of Team C3S, I wish you the best in all your future endeavors. Our deepest thanks to Commodore R.S. Vasan, Indian Navy retired and director C3S. Thank you, sir, for your able guidance under which we were able to conduct this event and for steering this dialogue as moderator by providing a clear context regarding the various actors in play in the Indo-Pacific region. The members of C3S are a distinguished league of servicemen, scholars, and statesmen. We are deeply indebted to you for your reliable support and for constantly raising the bar for research at C3S through your perceptive analysis and rigorous debates on a wide range of contemporary issues. Any institutional dialogue is only as good as the thought-provoking questions raised by an active and engaged audience. I extend my thanks to all of our participants, esteemed guests, valued readers and supporters, research scholars and interns for taking time out of your schedules to join us today. We hope you found this event insightful and we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Last but certainly not the least, I thank my colleagues, Mr. Bala Subramanian and Ms. Padma Shri for their tireless efforts, which have resulted in yet another successful event at APS. Thank you all once again, and Jai Hind. Thank, Thank you. you all for joining. Jai Hind.